Honkai Star Rail is changing. Now, it's a trend that many people have noticed. Uh, myself, Tectone uh, has talked about it. A lot of the other content creators have talked about it, especially the ones that talk about things such as you know, theory crafting and team building and stuff like that. A lot of people have talked about that. It's more than just build the fire character because you want to deal fire damage to the enemies with the fire weakness. It's still that, of course, but there are different, you know, things. There, there are a lot of different bosses in the game right now. It might be better to, to strip the enemy unit of buffs or put debuffs on the enemy unit rather than to buff your team in some certain scenarios. It depends. Um, if there's a boss, for example, that strips buffs from your team, obviously it's better to debuff them that rather than put a buff on one of your teammates or one of your you know characters that will get stripped away. Uh, that's just an example of one of the many things that could possibly happen when a game changes like this, and when mechanics, uh, when new different mechanics such as that are put into the game. Now. I am very open to this. I think this is probably good. I think that there should be a world where Fushuan is great, of course, but sometimes you want a character that can actually put big, like, like physical, like, shields on your characters, like actual shields, such as Japard or Adventuring when he comes out, or March 7th, or Fire Trailblazer, right? I think that there should be, I think that there should be a place for both of those in game rather than well, I have Fu Xuan. Now, I only would ever need Adventuring unless Adventuring is just directly better than Fu Xuan. No, better for different things, for sure. Maybe not straight up better in every situation, right? And that's, that's the direction that the game is heading in, and I think that that is very, very good. For example, a lot of characters have come out recently, and this has been a slow transition, but I really feel like it really... It really shows with the 2.0 characters, right? Especially mainly Acheron and Sparkle. Uh, whenever you're pulling for characters right now, like, Bronya, you know, she was great. She was great. And Ron May, she's great for just about anybody. The thing is, Sparkle is probably better than both of them, but for very specific characters. So if you have a Don Hong IL, if you have a Zila, if you have a QQ, you probably want Sparkle because it is definitely the number one Harmony character that you could possibly pair with those three characters, right? Other than that, if you don't have them, you probably don't want, you, you probably don't want her. Um, you probably don't want Sparkle. Unless you're pulling for design, which is a whole different thing, right? Um, but as for a character like Acheron, who is, you know, I, I don't know for sure. I haven't looked at any leaks. I haven't actually read anything, but everyone is saying, Right? And everyone is hinting at the fact that she will need somebody else to debuff them, and maybe she will deal more damage based on the debuffs that they have. She's a Nihility character. A lot of Nihility characters kind of fit, you know, a certain niche. Um, they're they're specialized uh, they specialize in different things, but that's the case. If you have a silver wolf, if you have other character uh, other characters that debuff, maybe even a Welt. I haven't seen so much of Welt, but Hela. Uh, then your Acheron will work very, very, very well with them. Um, if you have a character like, if you pulled for Kafka, right, you would want to pull for Black Swan. Now, I feel like the way that people were kind of looking at the characters in the game before was Black Swan. Oh, she is a damage dealer who deals damage that is wind. Oh, she's a wind damage dealer. So I will pull her to deal damage against wind units. Now me... I play against a decent amount of wind units. I already have Blade, but that's a different story. I wouldn't pull Black Swan in a million years if I didn't have a Kafka, right? Or at least maybe, you know, a Gwaniathan, a Sampo, a Luka, a Adventuring that I could build break effect on, because why not? Because um, he, he AoE can apply Bleed, which is the strongest dot in the game, right? Of course, and the same thing goes with kind of Kafka. Right, you weren't playing Kafka just on her own. At least, you know, most people wouldn't if they were, you know, trying to win. Uh, they were trying to beat whatever they're fighting. Uh, they would pair it with one of those other four stars that came out, and then now they've come out with another five star that 
kind of pairs right up there with Kafka, you know, one of the best duos in the game. Um, and this is a welcome change. I've said that like once or twice so far in these five minutes of this video, that this is a very welcome change. Um, I like the fact that, you know, it, it kind of annoys me that I have Fushuan and yes, she's incredible, probably best. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's probably, I think she just straight up is the best a sustain unit in the game right now. But the thing is, you can't really play her well with preservation path in, uh, what is it? In simulated universe. Why? Because it has to do with shields. You deal more damage based on your shields. But when you have a shield, you get different kind of effects. Your shield gets stronger, things like that. You know what? You know who you can play with that? Uh, Japard, adventuring when he comes out. You know, this is the example I've used already. But that's kind of the thing, right? Nihility characters, we're starting to see a lot of them are dot. And now, you know, there are, there is someone coming out that directly, you know, specializes with other characters that don't do dots, but just do like, uh, stat debuffs and things like that. Um, and Akron is going to be kind of crazy there. Uh, Topaz. Topaz is a little bit of an earlier uh, example of this kind of happening where why in the, a million years would you pull Topaz? if you don't use if, if you don't play follow-up characters right the game is clearly showing us what it wants us to pull right it wants us to pull you know with the pure fiction and the moc uh different you know buffs that happen right it sometimes in pure fiction it's like oh if you use your follow-up it does this if you alt it does this so you want characters like aoe alts for like the first one that came out right and then the second one was like, oh, you want, you will, all the buffs that are based off of and like everything that the, the, the buff is in Pure Fiction, the effect is all about damage over time. So if you don't have a damage over time character like me, you're probably going to struggle with that, right? You should try and make a damage over time team. You should try and make a good follow-up team that has good synergy. Uh, you should try and make. Uh, you should try and have good healers. Who knows? Uh, maybe at some point in the future, they're going to be like, oh, you will deal more damage based on a shield that you have on you for like a future MOC or a future uh, pure fiction. I could 100% see that after adventuring comes out to kind of reward the players who pulled for adventuring a little bit. Um, uh, MOC has kind of done that many times before where the effect for that one MOC was, I think, not this one, but the one before that was you, it, it just spawns a million debuffs on the enemy, right? And then that was right after like Dr. Ratio came out. That was like the patch after Dr. Ratio came out or whatever. And so Dr. Ratio always has like a hundred percent chance of throwing his follow-up attack because the enemies always have full debuffs on them. They do that in this game. They, they definitely show you what they want you to build and you know they reward people who have built for certain uh characters and certain kind of builds and i hope that kilios kind of goes into this he has 630 subs try and get that up um i know i actually have less so like i don't really know what i could do but you know if if you are watching this and you're a subscriber of me and we find that this video ends up being pretty good and you know discussing in more depth maybe the things that i just talked about with you guys uh, then hit him with a sub. I'm going to like the video. I'm going to sub right now preemptively because, you know, I'm reacting to his content and I feel like you know, he probably deserves it. Uh, let's, let's, let's get into this video. Let's react. As we're now approaching the start of year two of Honkai Sorrow's release, so much has changed from when the game was first launched to the state that we're in now. But Absolutely. It's constantly shifting, and what we consider the best of the best is now starting to become more and more normalized. Playstyles are ever-changing and evolving, and with time, we'll only continue to evolve and head to a new area to learn and improve. Things were meant to be easy and have a learning curve at hand. Progressively through time and time again, the game has steadily began to evolve with each patch. But together in this video, let's see just the things that Sorrow has been doing to raise the stakes, increase the difficulty that they want us as players to experience and learn now. Time and time again, as the game has progressively moved forward, we've always been challenged in some new type of way, shape, or form. And with the release of 2.0 and getting the glimpse of the new enemies that they've released, Absolutely. we start to realize that the entire gimmick that they're trying to prepare us for, or 
have us focus on begins to show a lot more clearly. All of the enemies that have released are not things that we're not already familiar with, but they're incorporating more ways to make other units also viable. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look into some of the 2.0 enemies. One of my favorites was the Dream Jolt Troops Beyond Overcooked. You know, that little chef dinosaur guy? He's kind of a fun fight. I also like the little noises he makes. I love when he goes into... And then he starts to go... And then at the end, he's just like... The great gimmick behind True. this chef dinosaur is he has two states. The initial state in which he's able to take up to six hits to then enter the ignite stove state which is essentially a buff state where you'll have to wait until the next turn to attack him again six times otherwise he'll use his powered up move flaming stir fry dealing aoe damage to the entire team now in order to get those six stacks you get those by attacking him six times or if you have dots on him each single iteration of a dot is considered to be one attack meaning that if it's best to stack as many dots on him as possible is you can try and burst him down before he uses his AoE attack. The added benefit is when he does have those six stacks, he takes 30% of his max HP as damage and 5% damage dealt to enemies adjacent to him. This seems oddly convenient, right? Yep. With a weakness to fire, lightning, and wind, three elements which are all very apparent in the damage over time roll, while also opening up avenues to some other neat situations. He is intentionally stronger. Well, he is intentionally weaker to dots dots kind of hard to counter everything that he wants and they did it in a very unique way how you verse i would say the hunkai star rail team is very very smart and very very good at their jobs i love what they're doing with the game and this is just an example of how the game is changing right dot characters are so much better against that guy against the chef t-rex than you know a, a follow-up character would or a i mean i don't know a, just a an AOE character, just a normal single target character. It's like you want dots, right? You just want dots. Do you know who else released recently that also seems to benefit from, from this? That would be Black Swan. Mm -hmm. Black Swan's in the hill, the unit that helps complete our damage over time team. Yep. Also being the debut Panacone released unit. It's almost as if it was like really well timed for them to release this unit also revealing a new enemy that benefits from the damage over time playstyle. Chef Boy or Dino is also usually paired up with another enemy, the Dream Jolt Troop Bubblehound, which has quite an interesting gimmick attached to him. The damage they deal is increased by the dots that are present. However, upon defeat, the Hound will also explode, dealing damage to adjacent enemies while also applying the bleed dot. This leads to interesting situations where you'll also get an extra attack for your dinosaur, while also being able to put another dot type on them, one which you don't really have any real reason to bring along to the fight given physical isn't one of the preferred weaknesses. These two enemies work really well together while also providing newer units to have benefits against them, and even bringing older units into the light to show their importance of going against this enemy. The other interesting enemy they released was the Memory Zone meme, Something Onto Death. For concepts of this enemy, being able to take away your teammates is actually super insane. It adds a new layer of difficulty where you have to plan your moves ahead in which you need to see which units you're willing to sacrifice to try and find an easy way to also bring them back. Similar to our Chef Dino, the Something Unto Death spawns Sombrous Sepultures. When taking away your teammates, you'll then be able to attack these Sepultures and have to attack them five times to free them from the cage. This further enhances mm -hmm. that Dot was one of the preferred matchups for this boss, where Dots are each considered to be an individual attack, Allowing for you to accumulate here hits faster to break your teammates out faster as well. Additionally, there are other ways to try and break free from this as well yep. by breaking the toughness bar. You'll additionally the dots, the, the things require five hits every time to free your characters, and dots are a hit applied. They also have more hits. That's crazy. Of it being one. It's there you go. Really telling that they want you to think more about each of your encounters, as well as to understand maybe I should take the time or else I may have to restart. Trial and error isn't always bad. I think this is a great way of trying to challenge players in order to do better overall. Stellaron Hunter Sam. Honestly, one of the boss fights I went into it expecting anything too crazy, but mm -hmm. the gimmicks in this fight are actually all super sick. Sam begins the fight nullifying any weaknesses they may have, but then enters the secondary combustion state, allowing for his weaknesses to be targeted while also reducing his own health to enter this state. Also, every attack he does while in this state consumes 1% of his health. The awesome gimmick this fight does have is by using your skill points while he's in the secondary combustion state, 
you'll be taking damage as well for each skill point used, while also reducing the amount of health restored by any healing reduced by 90%. Now, the great thing about Sam's fight is you're able to go about this in a few ways. You can go to break route, hereby breaking their shield, which will then cause them to leave the combustion state. Uh -huh. Or you can use five damaging skills on them, and it'll also dissipate this state as well. And Sam takes 50% more damage and recovers your skill points for your team. While it is an interesting case to say, Sparkle was a great character to be introduced for this patch as well, further enabling your team to have access to more skill points from her ultimate, while also providing a further buff to the Mono Quantum team. Coincidentally, also being the elemental weakness that Sam does have. Sparkle does give you this ease of access to dealing with them more, but also provides the team further buffs to be able to break him just a bit faster, allowing for you to take advantage of both scenarios when you can try and get them out of the combustion state as well. Sparkle's a great pick for this boss overall. This leads into the last enemy I do. I really, I, I just, I love that the way the game is going. I, I do. Uh, some people may find it unfair, like, oh, if I skip a character, they're going to release content that is specifically good for that character, and if I don't have that character, I'm not going to be able to do it. That's not exactly true. The game is still easy enough where if you have a well-built team, you should be able to build something that maybe isn't, you know, directly something that your team can support, uh, or it, it feels like it's meant to be against, but it definitely helps, right? A fight like this, right, as Sparkle comes out, like he said, is is very, very, very good for Sparkle havers and Sparkle enjoyers. And so is QQ, who is the Mono Quantum uh, character, or Azela even, could probably do well here. I mean, well, actually, I don't know about the Azela doing well here. I think it's probably just QQ. But um, yeah, I, the game the game is going in this direction you want to talk about and it's our final elite mob that was added i mean i'm kind of i'm not really talking as much during this video i did like nine minutes of talking at the very start i'm kind of just letting them cook right i'm letting them cook and i am soaking this all in he's, he's saying a lot of really good really smart things you know he's cooking Jolt troops sweet gorilla is also an interesting enemy as well i love the gorilla at a surface level there's nothing that's really too crazy about this gorilla but what matters more is how you have to deal with them. This gorilla has two attacking moves, limited free drinks and unlimited free drinks. Mm -hmm. At first, I didn't really consider this to be that big of a deal, and honestly, I still think you could realistically avoid it by dealing with the gimmick entirely or just not, not even paying attention to it at all. But the damage these moves deal is kind of crazy, and if you take the damage raw, your units are almost on the brink of death, thus leading to the second gimmick attached to these moves. The damage dealt by them can be reflected, and that's with the power of shields. This leads into the importance of where adventuring does come into play. Yep. The damage these enemies are starting to be... Adventuring is coming in. We have Japard. Well, no, we don't have Japard. I don't have Japard. Some people have Japard, right? But Japard is in the game. He is good for this. Uh, he's good against the monkey. So is, you know, if, if you were so inclined to use March 7th, I personally wouldn't. But yeah, I mean... Adventuring's coming out, and there's already a unit that he is very, very good at specializing against. Enemies are being treated. And just in general, shield-providing characters are good here, right? Just like skill point consumers, chuggers, are really good against Sam. Uh, dot characters are really good against... Uh, what was it? Uh, the... The chef dinosaur and, like, the void thingy is trying to bring different play styles back into the light well, yeah also further... it's, it's specializing play styles rather than like oh you have this you have the weakness okay that's good you have the weakness break that's good that's good break the weakness you're probably gonna win you know just weakness break them you know at least if you're fighting them with the element that he's weak too go get him no, it's more like uh no i built this very very good team uh and that that synergizes very well together and against the specific mechanics of this unit. I really like the way that the game is going. We don't know too much about Aventurine's kit, but what we do know is that he's an imaginary preservation unit. So far, we have a few things that can be considered. Japard is a preservation shielder with the ability to provide team-wide shields from his ultimate, but making it a bit unreliable after a point because you'll have to keep fishing for his ultimate. March 7 provides shields as well from her skill, but 
it's just for single target, making it a bit unreliable as well. Even I would say so. Preservation Trailblazer provides a small shield when they use their skill, but it's not really. It's so small. Team alive. Yeah, it's so Thus, small. Leading me to my idea behind adventure, maybe being the shielder that we're looking for to be able to just deal with this enemy a lot more consistently and not have to worry. Coincidences don't always equal results. And this could be entirely wrong, but with each unit released so far, alongside with some enemies that are released, the best way to sell a unit is to be able to provide for something for them to play better against. Mm -hmm. These are just the little things, where with the value of these enemies raising, the players are also improving in some way, shape, or form. Where slowly being dripped newer enemy types will also increase in the difficulty that they have individually to further challenge the players, as well as reward them for getting Jeez. better as the game goes further. I think this is a step in the right direction, and it's being done from a patch to patch basis, yep. overall to allow for the true benefits of a turn based RPG. Star Rail has gotten better, and so have its players. And this will allow for them to do more ambitious releases, and it truly does show overall. And that's all I've got for this. Thanks for watching. I'm always excited to see what is coming next in the game, and I really do feel as if the game's in a really healthy state for all the target audiences. Comment down below if you're something to improve on. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, peace. That was a really, really, really... That was a really, really, really good video. I think y'all should actually subscribe. I think y'all should actually like, I, please do this guys. Please do this. We're just gonna, we're, you know, we're just gonna leave a comment. Y'all should do that too. All right. Yeah. If you enjoyed this video, uh, you know, give me a like, give me a sub, uh, hit Kilios with the same thing on this video. I'm going to link it in the description. I really, really appreciate you all for watching. Uh, listen to me ramble for nine minutes before we even started the video. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Peace.